Welcome back to math in eighth grade that is connected to what's going on in our world today. And that is this idea of exponential growth, which relates to quadratic equations, kind of because we're talking exponents. But here we have a slight shift, a uh, different way of looking at things. Now we can look at things growing exponentially or decaying getting smaller exponentially, all right? We talk about the exponential explosion of the coronavirus. It starts off slow, 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 and then suddenly, boom, it's up here. That is a sign of exponential growth. It is not a linear relationship, but one that starts slow and curves upward, like half a parabola, all right? Which is the relationship to quadratics. The graphs look very, very similar, all right? So let's take a look, all right? We're used to f of x equals x squared, all right? The exponent here stays the same no matter what, and we vary x. In the idea of exponential growth or decay, we have a different formula. f of x is equal to kb to the x power. Now we are raising the power to something, where k is the beginning amount of something. You start with 100 viruses, or 100 people have coronavirus. Each one spreads, and it doubles every two days, or something like that. That doubling every two days is B. It is the growth or decay factor, all right? The multiplication rate, how fast, how big a number is that? If that number is higher than 1, we talk about growth. If that number is between 0 and 1, a fraction, we talk about decay. As you will see, it will get smaller. And then it is to the x power, and that is the number of cycles. The time frame or the amount of half-lives or things like that that we'll get into. All right? So we see these two basic equations. One is quadratic because it's the variable to some power, to in this case to the second power and only the second power, and one about exponential growth or decay where the exponent is the variable. Makes a difference. So you'll see problems like, all right, the number of virus, viruses, I didn't know how to spell viruses, so I just say the number of virus triples every month, all right? If there were 25 of them the first month, how many would there be after 10 months? All right. So one way to do that is you can make a chart and you can have the time, the number of months on one column and the number of viruses on the other. And at time zero, beginning, we have 25. After one month, that 25 has tripled, multiplied times three. And so after one month, we've got 75. After two months, that 75 has tripled to become 225. And after three months, the 225 has tripled, and now we're up to 675. Now we can keep doing that 10 times, but that gets to kind of hang out after a while, right? Another way to look at that is, you know, if we start off at time zero, if we're going to graph this, and we see zero as far as right here, and time on the x-axis, just like in physics, all right. We start here and we have zero is at 25. After one month, now we're up to 75. After two months, we're up to 225. After three months, we're like off the charts here. And we're going up real quick, as you can see. I mean, times three every month is not a linear thing. It does not form a straight line. It does not obey linear algebra. It forms a curve. And to deal with curves, we have to be able to deal with exponents, quadratics, and so forth, which is why I've put decay and exponential growth towards the end of our discussion of quadratics. Now, a better way to do it than making a column and a chart and then multiplying by three, multiplying by three ten times, would be to use the formula f of t for time, in this case, is equal to kb to that t power. The number of cycles each month is the exponent in this. All right? So that by replacing this, f of 10 months, the number after 10, will equal to the beginning amount, 
K, that's 25, the starting amount, times B, the growth factor, three times. Factor, multiply, times three. Everything goes up three times. And how many cycles we're talking about, that's X, 10 months, or T. The time is each month. So we've got 10. So basically, we're talking about 25 times 3 to the 10th power. All right? Good job for your calculators there. 3 to the 10th power. All right? You can use the little Y to the X key here and figure out how to deal with exponential numbers. Otherwise, you got to do 3 times 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 10 times. All right? Well, if you do that and you find 3 to the 10th power, that's 59,049. And that gets multiplied times 25. So this tells us that after 10 months, we started with 25, and now we're almost a million and a half viruses after 10 months. That's exponential growth, all right? And indeed, if you were to look at this, it would start off at 25, but then, you know, by the time you get up to 10 months, you are way off the charts there, all right? So... That's an example of exponential growth. Now, another perhaps more benign use of this is talking about growing your money instead of viruses. And that is the idea of compound interest. All right? And you can see problems like deposit 500 bucks at 7% interest, which you'll never be able to get today. All right? The interest rates are really, really low. I mean, if I can get 1% interest on savings nowadays, that's, I mean, that's about normal. But back when the books were made, 7% higher rates of interest were much more common, all right? So if you can get 7% interest, go for it, all right? Because this is what happens. You deposit 500 bucks, 7% interest, compounded annually. In other words, you get that 7% after one year. And then you get, after two years, you get the, the interest on the interest and then so forth and so how much after 14 years all right so we use the formula f of t equals kb to the t power all right k being the beginning amount 500 and now the rate factor the increase notice what that number is is a decimal i've changed seven percent to 0.07 and added that to the original one. So that basically what we're talking about is 1.07 every year. So in other words, after one year, I could do 500 times 1.07. And that would tell me exactly how much money I would have in there, which would be about 535 bucks. All right. So yeah, I get 7% of 500 is about 35 bucks. So now I've got, after one year, 535 bucks. After two years, I get 7% added on to this, not to that. So you see, once again, we're not talking linear here. We're talking higher, 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 and so forth, which is a characteristic of exponential growth. All right? So we fill in the formula here. 14 years is the number of cycles. 500 is the beginning amount. The rate of increase in this case it's increased because it's greater than one and that goes 14 cycles 14 years so 1.07 to the 14th power job for your calculator gives you 2.57 all right and that gets multiplied by 500 and then rounded to the nearest penny and what you end up with after 14 years is twelve hundred and eighty nine dollars and twenty seven cents all right so, yeah, double your age, you know, you're 14 right now, put 500 away, and by the time you're ready to go, 14 years later, <laughs> now you've got almost three times the amount of money that you started with. All right. Now, on the other hand, we can decay, we can decrease in a exponentially fashion, an exponential curve, all right? And the idea of decrease, typically, and most useful thing, is the idea of half-life, for all you gamers out there, all right? 
This is where they came up with the idea of half-life. Radioactive substances decay. They get less and less and less by a certain amount of time. They have what's called a half-life, a period of time where half of the stuff that you started with is now gone. It's decayed. The isotopes have broken apart and you don't have what you started with. All right? That's the idea of a half-life. And in this case, you have a starting amount of some substance, but the factor now is 0.5, one half, so that we are raising one half to some power, which you might suspect means that it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Because 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25, and that's half of what you started with, right? And then half of that, and then half of that, and then half of that. So, we've talked about carbon dating, for example, all right? And using isotopes, different numbers of neutrons compared to the same number of protons. Carbon typically has 12 protons, and, or 6 protons and 6 neutrons. And you get an atomic mass of 12, 6 plus 6, all right? But some isotopes of carbon have 8 neutrons. So you have 6 protons plus 8 neutrons gives you 14 in the nucleus, and that is the isotope carbon-14. It's still carbon. It still has all the same valence electron chemical bonding properties of carbon, except it's got those two extra neutrons in it, which makes it unstable, which means it doesn't last as long as carbon-12. In fact, carbon-14 breaks apart and half of it is gone after 5,730 years. This is the half-life of carbon-14, which allows scientists to use that concept to date organic materials. Anything that has carbon in it has a ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14. And if there's very, very little carbon-14 left, you can assume that it's much older than something that does have a lot of carbon-14 in it. All right? And the ability to use the decay formula allows scientists to calculate age, like the parchment and the ink in Timeline, where they use carbon-14 dating to figure out that it was 475 years old. Okay. So, if you start with 100 grams of carbon-14, how much will be left after four half-lives? Well, again, you could do a chart, and you could say at the beginning, no half-lives. At the beginning, you start off with an amount of 100. After one half-life, now you have half of that, 50. After two half-lives, now that 50 is cut in half, multiplied by a factor of 0.5, and now you got 25. After three half-lives, that 25 is down to half of that. And after four half-lives, you're down to 6.25 grams of carbon-14. So six half-lives, though, represents six times 5,730 years. So you can see how this can be used to date things, although evolutionists have a problem in explaining how do you know how much it started with? You see, you, may, you have to make an assumption about original ratios. And so all carbon-14 dating is based on these assumptions that uh, scientists use, and creationists would challenge those assumptions, just so you know. Okay. We could use, however, the formula which says that the function after four half-lives, all right, to the fourth power, the number of cycles, we're talking four of them, we have 100 is the starting amount times the decay rate, 0.5, a half. So very simply then we take 0.5 times to the fourth power, Multiply that by 100, and guess what? You get 6.25. All right. This is what it looks like on graphs. This is the difference here. Exponential growth, we're going up. Exponential decay goes down, and it approaches zero. All right. But if you think about it, you can keep dividing things in half and half and half and half and half and half. You never quite get to zero. And that's what that graph shows us. And some very important features of this graph is the y-intercept is the k-value, what you start with, all right? And the 
whether it's growth or decay depends upon B. All right. If B is greater than 1, then you're growing. If B is between 0 and 1, a fraction, then you're decaying. And that's what it looks like. Okay. So, with that in mind, you can answer some questions, take a look at some graphs, and figure out what's going on with some growth and decay by looking at Investigation 11 and doing A through I. And we'll see you next week.